Welcome back everyone to the State of the Nation. As I said, our current conversations on our nation's uh, economic recovery have been sidelined by shiny objects like uh, a conversation regarding Prophet Jerome, Natasha Indra Surya and Bruno Divakara. However, we as a nation need to get back to fixing our economy. Now, last Thursday night, the president reminded us how much more we need to do uh, while unveiling his roadmap to recovery. ईलांगा <laughs> තරුණ තරුවන් උරදෙන බව මට විශ්වාස. රටේ වගකීම බාරගෙන ඒ ඉලක්ක ළඟා කර ගන්නා බව මට විශ්වාසයි. මේ වැඩපිළිවෙල ඔබ අප සැමගේම අනාගතය ගොඩනක් වන වැඩපිළිවෙතයි. Well that was uh, President Ronnie Wickremesinghe addressing the nation last week. The road is long and narrow, but we must walk it anyway. So Sri Lanka needs to get its bearings together to ensure that we come out of this. Right now, there are efforts made by the government to hold talks with our creditors to ensure that they will restructure the loans as per the requirement by the IMF. However, we hear from the great point that uh, China is not happy to negotiate its debt in a manner where they have to lower the price of the principal loan, aka to take a haircut on the principal figure. Yes, the president said that a lot of progress was made. Yes, it's also true that the governor of the central bank announced uh, to the public that our reserves are up. The economy is slowly recovering. Interest rates uh, have been lowered. And more importantly, inflation is coming down. So let me ask you this question. Is the economy getting on the right track? Do you feel that when you go to buy your daily groceries, is the money you have in your pocket sufficient to last the whole month? We all know the answer is a resounding no. So what does it mean when the government states that everything is back on track, yet we are not feeling it? Remember, during last year, uh, unrest, the liberal clowns of economics uh, were screaming that it's because of inflation that everything is costly. Okay, I hear you. Then as per your theory, the price should come down when inflation comes down, shouldn't it? Let's get Dani Duvitana Masamin, who's at the data board, uh, to clarify uh, why this is. Uh, Dani good to see you once again. Now, earlier I requested you to find out as to why the cost of living remains high when all indicators, as per the government, shows a trend of dropping. What did you learn? Um, Maisha, I want to explain three things within this specific segment now to answer that question. One thing is to get what the government is saying, we have to understand what they're actually projecting, and that is a reduction in the inflation rates. Now, that has been the unique selling point for the government for quite some time. You see, it was in March 50, uh, over 50 percent, over 35 percent in April, and now in May, 25 percent. Uh, I think even the central bank governor last week was mentioning there is a steady decline in the inflation. So what we expect is that to be reflected within the prices. The second thing I want to explain is, Mahesh, we don't really understand what inflation is, the majority of the people. Inflation is the change in prices or the increase in prices, the rate. It's basically a, a correlation to the acceleration of a vehicle, maybe. That doesn't mean the prices have gone down. Basically to say that we are not seeing deflation in our country. But what we are seeing is that the prices have now reached a high extent and now it's within a plateau. To give you a practical example, Mahesh, if we actually look at the prices from one month ago to today, if the inflation was going down, we are expecting that the prices would have also gone down, but it's actually the opposite. Let me give you three examples. For beans, cabbage, and carrot, one month ago, beans was at 300. Today, in the main markets, you see it at 350. At one month ago, cabbage was, you could be found at 150. Today, it's 360. One month ago, carrot could be purchased at 120, and today it's 296. So there is no reduction, though we see last month that there is, a, a, like the inflation has gone down to this month, the prices have actually increased. And interestingly, Mahesh, in outstation, the samba, I think the majority commodity of rice that is being purchased, one year ago, it was actually cheaper than it is right now. Because one year ago, it was close to 200, uh, it, it, it was close to about 219, and now it has increased to, it has increased to uh, exponential level, now that is outstation. 
inflation. Obviously, if you look at the PETA market, it has come down. But we see that it is interesting that this unique selling point, the inflation unique selling point, is actually a false narrative, a false uh, uh, objective, a false sort of uh, point that has been put forward. We can't really understand the economy through it. Why do you think that was the driving force uh, with regard to the conversation we had uh, last year when the economy was being mentioned by especially these liberal clowns? They were continuously saying inflation, inflation, inflation. Uh, why do you think that was the narrative that they used? And uh, apparently, are they changing their story now? Yeah. The point was there, Mahesh. They wanted to argue, like you just mentioned, the, the printing of money. And the easiest way to argue that point is to say, okay, as you print money, there is inflation. Let's leave out all the other indicators and let's just talk about printing of money and uh, what, it's, what the inflation it's shows. It's being really shrewd, isn't it? Uh, misleading the public is, is exactly what they do all the time. And when their theories, which they uh, have learned from a book or something that they read uh, when they were bored, uh, and then they come back and try to preach to the country and when that theory doesn't go according to plan because they have no practical knowledge of it, uh, then they keep changing the story once again. Uh, that is something we've been seeing and I'm waiting for that narrative to change again as we move on. All right, Danidu Tharamazam at the Data Board, as always, thank you. Now, another area of focus for most of us uh, should be on the local debt restructuring plans, mind you. It's a prerequisite by the IMF to be in their program, at least uh, by the next uh, tranche expected in October of this year. We need to show the IMF that we are in line with the program and that a local debt restructuring is on the cards. However, it's more challenging than you think. If we restructure local debt held by most local banks, they will have to find new capital to cover the costs. So where are they going to find that? They cannot borrow more money. Hence, they will remove the capital or the profit they already have from the market to cover the losses, meaning less money for borrowing, which will clearly impact the business sector. Let's get more on this. And for that, joining me now is economic analyst Bram Nicholas. Bram, good to see you. Thank you very much for being here. Now, uh, do tell us why many are cautious about local debt restructuring. Is, it re is this really risky for Sri Lanka's economy? Uh, thank you, Mahesh, for having me on. I think the, the first issue uh, that I have is the framing of the problem itself. Because many uh, people in the financial media and in government are calling this a general debt crisis or a general debt problem. Uh, but I see it mainly as an external debt problem. After all, Sri Lanka did default on its external debt and not on its domestic debt. And recognizing that as the core problem is for me where it starts because the policies that the government should adopt going forward uh, should be primarily focused on earning the foreign exchange that is required to pay off that foreign debt and to service it. But instead, I'm seeing a lot of policies put forward by the government that are focused on fiscal consolidation and you know, now proposing to restructure domestic debt, which for me is really missing uh, the main problem. And so there are examples, right? Like, uh, for instance, that they uh, have decided to raise taxes. Now, generally, I uh, was uh, in favor of that because I think that, you know, it was clear to everyone that the tax base was much too low and compared to other countries, uh, developing countries, that is, uh, it was too low to be sustained. So no problem there. but the. The added problem was that taxes were also raised on exporters and those are the one sector that the government should be promoting in every way it can because, I say it again, it's an external debt problem, not necessarily a domestic debt problem. Yeah, understood, uh, Bram. Uh, now, if the government uh, moved towards uh, making domestic debt restructuring happen, let's hypothetically think, what are the key areas uh, of impact? The key areas to be impacted by a potential domestic debt restructuring uh, are really um, primarily the banking sector. 
So this issue has been raised by uh, members of the banking community and quite rightly so because restructuring domestic debt has a lot of negative consequences for the bank's uh, balance sheets and that uh, of course starts questioning whether they're uh, still solvent and that is just one of the issues but the other major issue there is that when domestic debt is restructured and it doesn't matter if that is a haircut on the capital value or a haircut on the interest payments or even an extension of maturity, it will all impact the value of whoever is holding those securities. Right? And that, in the case of the banks, but also the pension funds in Sri Lanka, is going to have quite a bit of a negative impact because the pension funds will have less to pay out to everyone that has saved with them. Uh, but there's actually one other problem that might be even more fundamental than the other problems is that when uh, as the government seems to be leaning towards is thinking about restructuring short-term debt, you start messing around with what is the core of, uh, let's say, liquidity management in the economy. So, let's say the government uh, extends some maturity on uh, treasury bills or even does a haircut on those treasury bills it's going to impact the value of assets that are usually used in crucial liquidity management like the repo market. Okay, so that is, is one of the negative consequences that I see for the financial system. Another is that generally you're going to start um, introducing the concept of the local government being able to default on local government debt. Now that rarely happens in a country because it's so important that everyone sees the government's, uh, government securities as the safe asset. And that then serves, so the rate on that safe asset serves as the benchmark for all other rates in the economy. So if you now start introducing the concept that that is no longer the safe asset and that in fact the government can default on its domestic debt, then we have to start wondering what now is going to be the benchmark rate for all asset valuations in the economy. And that uh, is a major yeah. impact. All right, uh, we have to leave it at that. Uh, thank you. That was economic analyst Bram Nicholas. Let's take a short break upon our return. Uh, we'll speak to author and economic professor from the University of Glasgow as to why liberal economists are so much pushing for erroneous policies that are harmful to nations. This is the State of the Nation back in a moment.